Um, <clears throat> so this is the uh, Python and TensorFlow talk. Uh, thank you very much for coming to this hour-long session uh, right after lunch. Um, I know if you, many of you are going to start getting sleepy right around the 40-minute mark, 30-minute mark. Uh, so do your best to stay awake. Uh, I'll do my best to keep you awake. Uh, so let's kind of work together to get through the talk. Um, so if the slides will advance. My, uh, just to introduce myself, uh, my name is uh, Ian Lewis. Um, I'm a developer advocate at, uh, excuse me, at, uh, at Google. Uh, I work on the Google Cloud Platform team, so that kind of encompasses all of Google Cloud Platform, so if you people are, not you people, but uh, if you, you guys are familiar with uh, things like App Engine or uh, Compute Engine or that sort of thing, uh, that's what Google Cloud Platform is. And uh, so I'm on, uh, on, on Twitter at Ian M. Lewis. Um, I've been tweeting like sort of throughout the conference, so you should be able to find me uh, fairly easily on, uh, on Twitter. Um, and just a little bit more of background about myself, I'm, I'm based in Tokyo, Japan. Uh, so I've lived in Japan for about 10 years. Uh, and I'm, uh, I've been kind of active in the, the Python community there as well. So uh, I'm one of the, the uh, four people who kind of founded the, the PyCon JP uh, conference, which is about a 600-person uh, conference, uh, just to give you an idea of the size. Um, and we're going to be having the conference in September, uh, in the third week of September, I believe. It's from the 20th to the 24th, I think. Um, and uh, if you look at PyCon JP, um, you can find out how to register. I think there are, uh, as of now, something like 20 slots left, so, uh, so hurry up. I'm also uh, pretty, uh, pretty um, enthusiastic about other kind of communities, so um, the, uh, the Go community as well as uh, the other open source kind of uh, projects coming out of Google like, uh, like Kubernetes and, the, uh, and Docker and those type of uh, containerization type of things. So that's the type of thing that you can uh, expect to hear from me if you follow me on Twitter. Um, so first, uh, just as a kind of a background, I want to go over kind of what deep learning is and um, kind of uh, give a very high level, not, not necessarily high level, but um, a sort of a quick overview of what that is. Like how many of you guys have went to the talks earlier in the day uh, about the uh, deep learning? So quite a few of you. Um, I'm going to try as my best to, uh, to kind of build on that, um, but there may be a little bit of overlap. So what are we talking about when we talk about deep learning? So we're talking, in terms of deep learning, we're talking about a specific type of machine learning, uh, which is using neural networks. And uh, neural networks are a way of doing machine learning, where you build this kind of network of nodes uh, that are interconnected. Uh, so you essentially give something like this, this cat picture, uh, you change the pixels into a, uh, a kind of numerical representation, uh, you pass that through as part as the input layer into the uh, the uh, network, and each of these no internal nodes will take the the internal the uh, values from your uh, input and do some operation on them, and then eventually give you the the output. So these are typically uh, organized in, in layers. So you can see this blue one is the uh, is the input layer. Uh, the orange one there is, a, is a, what's called a hidden layer. Uh, so if you think of a, a neural network as kind of a black box, uh, the hidden layers are the, the layers that are actually inside that do the operations. And so each one of these little nodes is, is, uh, um, does some sort of operation on the, uh, on the input, and uh, that's called basically an activation function. Um, and then each of these are kind of linked together uh, using weighted connections. Uh, so each of these little lines uh, connecting the, uh, the, the layers will be weighted uh, to indicate like a strength between each of the layers. So what are, the, what are neural networks good for? So neural networks are essentially good for kind of classification and regression problems. So these are very wide class of problems uh, that uh, that you can apply machine learning to. Um, so 
Classification is basically putting things into buckets. So you can have like a bunch of predefined buckets like A, B, C, and then you get some input and you say which bucket does it go in, uh, and then you basically put it through the network and you get a probability that it goes in A, B, or C. And regression is a little bit more, uh, somewhat more complicated in that you get, uh, instead of like a, a probability that it goes into a single bucket, like as, you know, between zero and one, you get kind of a, a scalar output. So say you have our, you are, you get some values into your neural network and output, you want to say like is a temperature. So like from, from, you know, say zero Kelvin to some value, uh, or some, some, uh, temperature. Uh, that's more like a scalar or a, uh, would be, could be solved by a regression problem. Uh, I'm going to be talking mostly about, about uh, classification problems, but um, regression is also something that uh, neural networks are pretty good at. So what, is, what does that actually look like? Uh, so here's a, um, a, a little demo that's uh, available at playground.tensorflow.org. Uh, this is like a little demo that allows you to kind of look into a neural network and kind of get an idea of what's going on. Uh, so here we have some input features. So these are uh, some values that you add, that you input into the network, uh, and then you have some hidden layers in the middle, and then you get some sort of output. Um, so if you went to some of the uh, earlier presentations, you saw something similar to this, where you have, say, a, uh, um, my example I'm going to use is, like, say, that you have, like, uh, the weight and height of a person. Uh, and then you have two different categories here, like these orange ones are maybe children, and these blue ones are, say, adults. Uh, so if you want to classify a new piece of, of data coming into your, uh, your network, you could say, you know, train a network to do this, but this is really, you know, very easy to do. Like, this is essentially a, a linear classification problem or a linear regression type of classification problem where you can just draw a line in between the two uh, and get... Uh, a way of predicting between pre predicting between the two, but let's say you have something a little bit more complicated. Let's look at one where the the one category is completely encircled by the others. Uh, so if we were to do something like this and then try to train using just uh, some you know x uh, x and y inputs, uh, this would actually never basically never converge. You would never figure out how to do this properly. Uh, so we can do things like uh, add a hidden input layer uh, that will essentially do the, the, uh, uh, the, this kind of linear classification multiple times. Uh, so you can say, let's do this one time. Uh, we'll see that it basically creates one line here. So everything on this side, it will classify as orange, and this side it will classify as blue. Uh, but then when we add like new layers, whoops, uh, not layers, but new nodes, we can actually see that it gets a little bit more complicated. So we could say it now figures out two lines, or uses two lines, and then aggregates the result together. So you can see in the one node, it's done one kind of linear regression. In one node, it's done another. And then when you combine that together, it kind of makes this band here. And then, whoops, not this one, that one. Uh, now if we do it with three, we can actually combine the result three times, and we get kind of a like triangular type of structure. So like, uh, as we add these kind of nodes and, and hidden layers, we can do things that are more and more complicated. OK, so that's great. So like, but how do we classify something that looks more like this? Uh, so this is kind of a spiral-looking thing. And these, this spiral is blue, and this spiral is orange. This is something that's a, quite a bit more difficult, and we can't necessarily classify this using something like just x and y inputs. So you can imagine maybe sine would be good or x squared, uh, but even still, like we don't really get very, very good output uh, just by having a very shallow kind of uh, network with just three nodes here. So in order to, be, to actually make this a little bit more complicated, or to or to solve these more complicated problems, um, we need a much more complex network. So for something like this, this may or may not actually converge, uh, but it's getting there. So, so right now, this is actually not terribly stable, but it will stabilize. So, like, so once you, if you have these kind of more complicated networks that you can kind of put together, 
uh, you can actually start solving more and more complex problems. Uh, and so I'll, I'll talk a little bit about why that's important a little bit later. But you can see that each in, in, of these individual nodes like, has their own kind of uh, addition to, this, to, the, uh, to the final output. And then each of these little lines here are weight, uh, show the weight. So these blue ones are positive, and these uh, orange ones are negative. So that's going to show us that the negative ones are actually an inverse, inverse relationship. So with these inverse relationships, you can essentially just you know, reverse the, the orange and the blue uh, in order to get the right type of output. But um, essentially, you can have these kind of positive and negative weighted uh, connections between the different nodes. So let's turn this off so it doesn't burn my CPU. And then let's go back here. Uh, by the way, that, that demo is basically just a way of getting to understand neural networks. It's not actually using TensorFlow under the hood. It's like all done in JavaScript in the browser. Uh, but um, it's essentially a way of like kind of getting a, a familiar, more familiar with neural networks. So what is a neural network? So a neural network is essentially, uh, when you break it down, is um, essentially a pipeline of uh, basically taking something like a matrix, uh, what is essentially called a tensor, uh, and putting it through like this pipeline of uh, operations. And so you can imagine that each of these is, say, like a matrix multiplication type of problem or type of uh, function, where you take uh, one matrix, multiply it by another matrix, multiply it by another matrix, and another, and another, and another, and another, and then eventually you get out a, uh, a tensor that represents the output. Um, for a particular, uh, for your particular problem. And this is basically very loosely modeled after how uh, the brain works and in, in how the, uh, the, the individual nodes like have, uh, have w a kind of strength or a weight uh, in between the, or the neurons in your, in your brain have a certain weight between them. But from a, from a practical point of view, you're essentially doing matrix operations uh, on on a, a bunch of times in order to do some sort of prediction. So I mentioned what a, a, a tensor, um, and this is where the, this is what a, uh, where TensorFlow gets its name, um, but a tensor is not something that people necessarily think of very often or don't encounter it too often, um, unless you're a machine learning type of person. Uh, but um, most people are familiar with things like vectors and, and matrices, and a tensor is essentially a generalized uh, version of that. Uh, so you can imagine like a, this kind of like 2D like Euclidean space uh, or 3D space, uh, and then you have some sort of value uh, out here in the space. Uh, and so for something like a vector, you know you would have like you know a 2D type of vector, um, and that could be say represented by a a single array in a programming language, uh, or a matrix, which is a you know a three-dimensional vector or a two-dimensional vector. Um, but a tensor is essentially a generalized version where you have this n-dimensional uh, type of vector. So you could have like any number of, of, uh, of dimensions. Um, so this could be uh, one dimension for each type of feature that you're actually adding to the, uh, into, the, um, into the network. And you can essentially do the same sort of operations on a tensor as you would on a, say, a matrix. So like matrix multiplication, uh, matrix addition, that sort of thing. So how, the, how a basic neural network works is that you would have these kind of connected nodes. Uh, so this is our input vector, our input tensor, uh, with x1, x2, x3. Uh, then we have a weights uh, uh, tensor or that is represented, uh, that you can then multiply against. Uh, and then finally, we add the resultant result uh, biases uh, in the form of the tensor, and uh, then softmax it to get a, the output. So this is a very, very basic one-layer uh, one network. But you, you can think of these individual, uh, not these individual uh, um, weights or whatever are not each uh, matrix multiplications, but essentially this. This matrix times this matrix is this kind of interconnected, uh, makes this kind of interconnected um, pattern. And so this is how like the, the, uh, 
if you went to the, some of the earlier talks, uh, most of the, uh, the operations are, are formed in this way, where you have uh, the input x times w, which is the weights, uh, plus b, which is the biases. And then you can do that multiple times for, for each layer in the network. And so these are basically just multiplications and additions. Uh, and then we have this kind of softmax thing at the end. This softmax is essentially just to form a, uh, a way of normalizing the data once it comes out. Uh, so you'll typically see these at the very end of a network. Um, so what happens is after you've gone through this network, these outputs, what it would be at this level is uh, you would have some sort of value like say 50. Uh, this one's like 50, this one's like 20, this one's like 0.32. You know, and like, so you don't really get an idea of like what that actually means. Uh, that's kind of, these values are kind of a relative value uh, for your actual network. Uh, so when you put this through the, the softmax function, this, this will actually normalize it to a value between one and zero. Uh, so you can get essentially a prediction output. So, and then these, these individual values would represent uh, whether the, the percentage, say, of uh, that a particular value goes into a particular bucket. Say this is a cat, dog, and this is a human, uh, and we put in an image value. The output might be like that it's 0.99% certain that it's a cat, and 0.01% certain it's a dog, and 0.001% uh, certain that it's a human, which essentially means that it's a cat. So that's great. So that's how like, we actually like, do prediction. So like, we say input and input. We go through all these operations, and we get some sort of predictive output, right? But how do we actually train a, uh, a model? So a model is trained in, a, in this way, where you, have, uh, you use a method called backpropagation, uh, which was talked about at some of the uh, earlier talks. Um, but essentially what you have is you have this. This here is the uh, neural network, as we've been talking about it before. So here's, like say, one layer. Here's a second layer. Uh, here's our softmax, and here's our output. Um, and we actually go through here, and we do the prediction. Um, but then what we do is we use, we use test data to actually, uh, as we put it through our uh, network. So we have some test data that says, here's, here's the actual data. Here's a cat picture. Uh, this is a cat. Uh, so you have the actual value, uh, or the actual output, the expected output, and the actual uh, the, the test data uh, associated with each other. Uh, so you know which ones are cat pictures, which ones are dog pictures. Um, and so what we do is we put this, say, that cat picture through here, and then it comes out with a, with a result. And what we do is we take that result and, we, uh, and the expected value, uh, and then we find essentially the, dif the difference uh, between those two uh, values. So say if it came out that it was you know, 0.86% certain that it was a cat, but we know that it's 100% certain that it's a cat. We want to be able to nudge our, our network in the direction of actually determining uh, with 100% accuracy that it's a cat. So we'll uh, take the, this output and use what's called a loss function uh, to find the difference. Uh, so a typical loss function might be cross entropy, uh, but there are a number of other loss functions that you can use depending on the situation. And then you go through. Uh, these other, you kind of optimize the results uh, by using something like gradient descent. Those were also talked about a little bit earlier. Um, I'll talk a little bit more in general about uh, these kind of optimization or, or especially gradient descent. Um, but essentially what you do is you put through this, this optimization uh, function and then back propagate all the values into the weights and biases for each individual uh, layer. So these, these, this weight one, weight two, bias one, weight two, and bias two are actually the weights and biases from, that are used in the network here. And so what you're doing here is you're essentially back propagating all these values and, and updating the, uh, the weights and biases uh, and um, kind of nudging the, the network in the direction of actually going, doing the, giving you the proper output. Uh, and then you do this uh, essentially many, many, many times uh, you know, training it over and over and over and over again, uh, and it is eventually nudges into the direction of, of being a very uh, an accurate network. At, at least that's the, that's the theory. So this doesn't always work, but, uh, but in general that's the idea behind it. So that's kind of like an, a relative overview of how the, um, 
what neural networks are like. Um, so why are we actually talking about this? Uh, so uh, one of the earlier talks mentioned uh, things like that uh, these like ImageNet uh, is a you know a famous uh, open data set about for for machine learning um, would get like say like 25 percent error rate in like 2002, um, but so. Essentially, the reason why we're talking about these kind of deep neural networks all of a sudden is because uh, people have started to get very much better at, at creating these neural networks. Um, and this is because of a number of kind of breakthroughs in terms of uh, training these networks to do things that are actually practically useful. So you can think of the, the quality of a, of a neural network uh, kind of like this. So like kind of traditional, uh, Deep, or traditional learning uh, algorithms uh, would kind of, as you give it more data, would kind of increase in performance, but it would kind of level off at a very quickly. And then you would have like small, these small neural networks, which would also kind of level off quickly. Um, and so essentially what people did was they would, you know, train the amount of data to about here, or give it a certain amount of data to about here, uh, and then they would basically, you know, they wouldn't, adding more data wouldn't actually make it much better. So they would essentially be able to stop right here. But we've since found these kind of, uh, these, you know, neural network methods that allow us to scale the, uh, the learning much better. So as we throw more data at the problem, they actually get uh, quite a bit more uh, sophisticated and, and have quite a bit better performance. So we've been able to create these large, deep neural networks uh, that will continually get better as we give it more and more data. And with that comes like other problems, uh, which I'll talk about in a second. Uh, but essentially, these, these like medium and, and large neural networks have become possible recently. And so here is a, uh, a model of what the, uh, this is a Google, the Google Net um, uh, network. Um, that was used, this is called, this is essential, the inception model that was trained on GoogleNet. Uh, and so what this is essentially doing is like labeling pictures or labeling images. So you can think that each, of, each one of these uh, as being, say, say, a matrix multiplication uh, or some sort of operation on a matrix. Uh, and then it goes through uh, several different kind of layers uh, and then eventually gives you an output tensor that tells you the, uh, the labels. So this is what we mean when we talk about deep neural networks. So networks that are essentially have like many, 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 many layers before they actually give you this, this output. And by adding these layers, we actually can start uh, getting more and more complicated, uh, you know, solving more and more complicated problems uh, and actually getting uh, pretty good results about with them. But this gives us a problem where we have, you know, you can imagine that each one of these is a matrix multiplication and these tensors might be, uh, you know, a large image like a megabyte or something and you're changing that into a tensor and then doing a matrix multiplication on it. You can imagine how many actual, uh, you know, operations you have to do uh, in order to actually train this or to do even prediction even just once. Uh, so you have to do this many, 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 many times over in order to actually train a network. And so what people do is they use GPUs, um, and these GPUs are very good uh, and high powered, but still you're essentially waiting for like weeks or, or sometimes even months for the results of actually one, one single training run. So what people started to do is like, they use like supercomputers uh, in order to train models faster, um, but still this is, is a problem because not everybody has access to a supercomputer. How many of you guys have access to a supercomputer? Somebody does. That's, that's the most I've ever seen. That was like three or four, I think. Um, so uh, how much do you pay for that, by the way? So those are, those are um, supercomputers are, are something that you have to lease time on. So they're like the, old, the mainframes of old, you know, where you had to like lease some time, you know, 7.30 to 8.30 and, you know, like in the middle of the night or something like that. Uh, and you pay tons of money for them. So they're not exactly the easiest or the best way. Uh, and we wanted like, you know, the ideal thing is to be able, for everybody to be able to do machine learning. So what you need is kind of distributed kind of training. Um, 
And so like, at Google, we've been able to do that. Uh, and so we use it for a lot of practical applications, things like uh, Google Photos uh, and like detecting text in Street View images. Um, so there's a lot of kind of exciting things that are going on. And uh, essentially, recently, we've these kind of breakthroughs have allowed uh, quite a lot of activity at Google. Uh, so this is a number of uh, projects uh, internally at Google that use uh, that use learning uh, machine learning. This is just the number of directories that contain a model description file. Uh, but you can see from 2004, we've got this kind of hockey stick growth. And uh, yeah, by distributing it, we've been able to do you know much much faster, et cetera, et cetera. Okay. So now I'd like to talk about TensorFlow itself. Um, so TensorFlow is an open source library. Uh, it's a generic or a general purpose machine learning library uh, for uh, particularly for doing neural networks. We are also uh, kind of expanding it to uh, encompass other types of machine learning. Um, but uh, it was open sourced in November 2005. Um, and it's used by internally at Google uh, for a lot of our uh, internal projects. So it supports a number of things like, you know, uh, you know, this kind of flexible and intuitive construction, uh, you know, to do, basically be able to do a lot of things uh, in an automated way. Um, and you can, it supports training on things like CPUs and GPUs, et cetera. Um, but one of the nice things is that you define these kind of networks in Python. So uh, before I kind of dive into looking at what TensorFlow looks like, uh, some of the core concepts is that you have a graph. Uh, so TensorFlow is, the, the name of TensorFlow comes from the idea of like taking tensors and then having them flow through a flow graph or a, or a directed uh, data flow type of graph. Uh, so a, a graph is a representation of that. Uh, these, the operations of the actual nodes, the, the operations that you do, uh, and then the tensors are the data that's actually passed through the, uh, through the, um, the network. And then we have other types of con uh, structures. So we have these, like, the idea of these constants, which can be something that doesn't change. Um, but then you have things like placeholders. Um, these are basically inputs into our, into our network. Uh, these, these variables. Uh, so variables are things can, that I can actually change during the training. Uh, so these are the things that you usually use for your weights and biases, et cetera. And then session is something that actually encapsulates the, um, the overall uh, like connection between uh, TensorFlow's core and uh, how you actually, uh, def and the models that you define. So I should mention that TensorFlow is a library that uh, is based on the same sort of concepts as many other libraries, kind of scientific libraries, where you have a, a Python uh, interface or an API, uh, and then it has a kind of a C++ core that uh, enables you to do these kind of very fast operations. Uh, so when you're actually doing training, you don't, you're not actually going through the Python VM. So these are, you know, uh, a non-exclusive or a non-exclusive uh, list of all of the uh, operations you can do with TensorFlow. So things like math, uh, addition, subtraction, multiplication, division of of these tensors, uh, matrix operations, uh, stateful kind of operations, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So let's actually look at what this looks like. So I'm going to run through. So this is a this is a, a Jupyter notebook. So how many people have heard of Jupyter, used Jupyter, etc.? Okay. Uh, how many people have been asked that more than five times at this conference? <laughs> yeah, that's what I thought. Uh, so I'm going to just assume that you guys know Jupyter and like, just kind of go from there. Uh, but let me actually just restart this kernel here. Yes, this is a Python 2 one because uh, TensorFlow also supports Python 3, if I remember right, but uh, this particular example is Python 2, yeah. Um, so TensorFlow is uh, pretty easy to get started. There's like, this is, this is just using the uh, kind of MNIST example. So one of the, uh, um, 
So Mr. Rashid was talking about the, the MNIST example earlier today, but it's essentially a bunch of images that are kind of handwritten numbers, uh, and then you do OCR on those to, to determine which uh, type of, uh, which number is actually present in the image. So the training images look something like this, where you have 55,000 images, uh, and they're all in this big, huge, long uh, array, of, uh, and each one has 784 pixels. Uh, and they're basically mono, monochrome, so like they're just black and white. Uh, but the, the, and so if you look at the shape of that, you know, it's a 55,000 uh, size array um, with the 784 pixels. But if you look at the, the, the images, they're essentially, each value in it is the, uh, this is each one of the images in a, in a uh, kind of a two-dimensional array. Uh, and each of these values is a, uh, a value from zero to one of essentially how dark that particular pixel is. Uh, so some of these are like 0.23, which is kind of a light gray, uh, all the way up to one. So that's essentially what the data looks like. Uh, so that's how we've actually represented here. Like if you had a color image, you would need to represent it a little bit differently. Um, but that's essentially how we're doing it in this case. And then uh, this is just using, uh, this is just showing an example value. So using uh, matplotlib. Uh, so this is just one of the input images. So that's essentially what the training data looks like. But then we have these training labels uh, that uh, are associated with each image that says, that's basically a 10, uh, you know, an array or a vector of size 10 uh, with, you know, uh, a bunch of zeros in it and a one in the right location that, sh that indicates the number of the, uh, for that particular image. So for this image, we have an eight here. So if we look at the, the training labels, the shape of that, it's a 10, 10 size. And then if we look at this, the particular one for this eight, we can see that the one is in the, uh, what is it? This is like zero to nine or something in this particular column. So in the eighth column, I think this is like the zero is, for, is actually for zero. So it's from zero to nine. So that's, that's essentially what it, this is. These are actually called one hot vectors uh, in, where you have zero uh, in all of the values except for one. Uh, and this is used often in training data, but the data that you'll get out of it is actually similar uh, to this, except for it will be a bunch of uh, values from zero to one, essentially a probability. Uh, and so here's uh, some of the images, but uh, as your, some images of, that I've kind of shown earlier, um, but so once you're training it, uh, you can kind of get uh, these, you can train it to show these different, uh, uh, set these weights and biases so that like individual pixels like will indicate whether it's a, uh, a particular number. So in this case, we're actually using a very simple uh, neural network, which will kind of, with, with just one layer, which will uh, work this way. Um, but essentially, like, if you see pixels in these blue areas, that's probably a zero. And if, it's in the, if, you're, if there's any pixels in here in the red area, then it's probably not a zero. And then it, like, basically aggregates the, uh, the probabilities in order to decide whether this is a zero or not. And you can kind of see that in, in many of the other ones. So like uh, this one's a one. So if you see pixels in this area with a two, it's like in this area and three in this area. So they look similar to the actual values, uh, the numbers you're looking for. So did I actually execute all these? Okay, good. So the next one, this is actually us defining our uh, our network. So here we're, defined, we're importing TensorFlow and we're using the placeholder that I talked about earlier. This is our input into the, uh, um, into the neural network and we have, it is a size of 784. So this is the, the size of the, the number of pixels. Uh, and then we have these weights and biases as variables, uh, which can be updated as we train uh, the model. Uh, and then here's actually where we define our, uh, our network. So here is, this is just a sing single layer network. So what we're doing is you can define it very similarly in Python to, to the way that you would do it in, in mathematics. So uh, here we can say that we're doing a matrix multiplication on the input times the weight uh, and adding it to the bias uh, variable uh, and then doing a soft max on it at the end. 
Uh, and then TensorFlow internally will take these and build our kind of, uh, our like data flow uh, diagrams, or our data flow, you know, kind of model representation. So once we have that out, we can then use that to, uh, to then uh, train our model. So this is actually our, our, our neural network. Uh, and then we have a placeholder for the output with this Y prime. Uh, and we've defined a cross entropy function. Here's our loss function. And then we can basically uh, put it into this gradient descent optimizer uh, and optimize it using cross entropy. And this will then create our kind of training step. So this, is, this encompasses the entire, uh, the entire uh, neural network plus the training that we need to do. And as gra like, like the, uh, some of the other explanations and some of the other talks, gradient descent is essentially a way of uh, kind of nudging our neural network in the direction that we want it to. Uh, so um, I think one of the, uh, the talks uh, talked about uh, using, going down a mountain using a, a single little, uh, you know, a flashlight or a torch, uh, and then kind of just going a little bit at a time uh, down the mountain. Uh, but essentially, that's the idea. You're essentially going down, uh, moving it in the direction uh, towards, uh, towards a, a minimum uh, to actually minimize the loss. So that the, say the, this altitude would be the, the error or the loss uh, generated by the loss function. Uh, and then we basically nudge it in a direction where the loss gets minimized. And then essentially do that just over and over and over again. So each one of these would be a training epic as we're going down the gradient descent optimizer. So here, what we're going to do uh, is we're going to train uh, a thousand times uh, on a particular piece of data. Uh, and so what's great is that uh, we can also do this kind of mini batch training, which is um, a way of you basically pick just a, a small subset of the total training data. So we're not actually training every single time on the, every single piece of the training data. Uh, we're actually training on a random, randomly selected batch of, uh, in this case, 100, I think, or yeah, 100 elements. And we're doing that essentially uh, 1,000 times. This is taking way longer than it usually does. Um, and so the, what's good about that is that you don't have to train on the entire training data. You can essentially uh, do something that's, uh, you basically pick a randomized uh, you know, subset of the training data. And that's essentially the same thing you do when you do like say a, a statistical survey, when you ask a bunch of people something. You, you basically get a, a significantly, or uh, a, a, uh, a representative sample of the data. Okay, so this is actually done, by the way. Okay, so, the, uh, so this, I've actually run through the training, uh, and then um, at the end, we can, we can actually check the accuracy of our neural network. So in this case, we're actually got about 90%, which is pretty bad, uh, but this is a very simple, like, one-layer neural network. Uh, so that's essentially, like, kind of how you can, you can use TensorFlow. Uh, you can... Uh, basically create these, tens, these, uh, these steps to, to run through it. Uh, but all of these steps are actually, or all of the actual computation is done under the hood in part of the CPU, or in the, the, uh, the, uh, the C++ core. Uh, and that's also mapped uh, um, to, it maps actually to devices. So if you have GPUs or CPUs available, it will actually map the operations to those particular devices. So in this case, I'm running this on like, say, like I think a 32 core machine. So it'll actually map that. So I'll talk a little bit about TensorBoard later. But let me go back to the, can I go back? Let me see if I can find the back button. This is not fun. It's not the back button, it's a whole new thing. Okay. So here I'm going to look at a little bit more, uh, a little bit more complicated example um, where we can get a little bit better accuracy. Um, so here we're, we're training, or we're using the same exact data that we did before, um, but we're gonna actually use, build what's called a convolutional network. And this is, uh, this was talked a little bit about earlier. Um, and 
So this, is, this basically allows you to, uh, to look at the image, like kind of in parts, um, and, uh, and uh, basically pick the specific features from each part of the image. Uh, and this helps with things like, like say if you write the way uh, that I had it earlier, you know, you had the, the image and you had like, cert if you saw pixels in a certain location, then that would indicate what number it was. Uh, but what happens if you write this, the, the, uh, the, the zero or whatever, but you actually translated it slightly o over a little bit? Uh, that would actually change the way that the, uh, you know, the na that particular network wouldn't be very good at figuring out that, that I just moved the zero over a few pixels instead. Uh, so, so stuff like that, that's kind of convolutional uh, looking at it uh, helps a lot. But um, in this case, what we're going to do is we're going to initialize the weights and biases a little bit different. I think this one is just uh, doing this kind of, uh, what was it doing? I think this one was picking like kind of random, uh, random weights to begin with. Um, but here's the kind of convolution part. Uh, so essentially what we're doing is we're going over the image uh, and we're picking a particular, uh, these, are, these are what, what, the, uh, what are called kernels, I guess, over the image. And then we're kind of building this other uh, value or this other kind of tensor that indicates uh, that has a particular value for each of the or for each of the uh, the picked uh, kernels over the over the image, and then we can actually work on these. So this is just picking kind of features of each individual part of the image, rather than looking at the whole image or the image as a whole. Uh, then we can take uh, take that those type of things and use what's called pooling. Uh, pooling is another kind of a method that you use to uh, Basically, kind of one, the most common example is max pooling, where you take uh, the, the individual values from a part of the, of the tensor and you pick the maximum value. Uh, so this kind of like gives you a somewhat of a representation of a particular part of the image as well. And then kind of put that all together into, uh, into a layer, and then you can do that, like create several layers that, like, that look like that. So here we're doing a, set, a full our first convolutional layer uh, by building these bases, the, building the weights and biases, and then uh, building our uh, uh, layer here. And then the second convolutional layer takes the inputs from the, or the outputs from the previous layer uh, and does the same, basically the same sort of uh, thing. And then at the end we create like a, a this is a densely connected layer, so as the, uh, some of the previous talks talked about, like the convolutional layer is not 100% uh, connected between the values because uh, they're actually using uh, this kind of translated kernel over the image. But uh, the final output layer is kind of a densely connected layer, which allows you to kind of just do basically the exact same thing that we did in our previous layer, but we're just, we, don't ha we didn't have the convolutional part. Uh, and this uh, will, allow us to, um, you know, get a, a much better kind of output. Uh, I'm not going to really talk about dropouts, um, but, and then we have basically the re-out layer, and this is essentially just doing the softmax on the output of our, uh, of our last part of the, the uh, our, of our last output from the previous layer. And then you can kind of train and execute the model. Uh, this, in this particular one, we're doing this using the same kind of cross entropy, uh, but we're using an atom optimizer instead of a gradient dis the regular gradient descent optimizer. Uh, and then with those kind of optimizations, you can kind of get a, uh, a much better uh, output or a much better performance. So here we're actually doing a lot more training on this particular one because it's uh, a, a deeper network and we can, we can train it or it scales a lot better. Our previous one, if we continued to train it more and more, it probably wouldn't get, it wouldn't get very much better than 90%. Uh, but in this case, we can train it quite a lot more times uh, in order to improve the accuracy. So we actually train it about 20,000 times on uh, many batches of 50. Uh, and so they will go through, this is actually me doing this, because this takes about five minutes or something uh, to actually run through. Uh, but you can see from the output that we get about 99.2% accurate. Uh, which is 
a good deal better than 90, 90%, right? So instead of one in 10, you know, it's like around one in 100 is, uh, is, is classified incorrectly. So you can do things from, from very uh, simple networks to more co much more complex networks. So let me go back to my So one of the other things that you can do, because TensorFlow has this kind of internal representation or knowledge about how the graph and everything is working together, is you can essentially lo like write log output files uh, as you're doing training. Uh, and these can then be read what, by, a, by an application called uh, TensorBoard. Uh, so we were obviously very uh, unique, nice with the names, you know, TensorFlow, TensorBoard, you get the idea. Uh, but what this is really, what's really cool about this is that, uh, where is it? Can I make the, where do I make this bigger? There it is. Is that you can look at the, uh, the um, things like the accuracy, the, the values of the loss functions, uh, and uh, these, look at these kind of graphs as, as you are training and going over the data uh, to kind of see how uh, your network is performing. So in this case, we're seeing the actual accuracy as we're training it. So this is one of the, this is data, I think, on, an old, on the, the simple version. So once we get up to about 90%, we get there pretty quickly, but we don't really get very much better as we train the data. Uh, but you can look at like, things like the accuracy, but then you can also look at the, the actual loss function. So this is cross entropy, looking at the cross entropy value, and that kind of goes down and down and down and down. So this should actually be the, close to the inverse of the, uh, the accuracy. But you can also look at many of the other values, uh, and this, these basically correspond to the, to the variables uh, or the, the, uh, the individual parts of your, uh, um, of your uh, the, basically the, the values that you have. So here, cross entropy was an actual uh, object, a Python object that you can use, or that was defined, and then you can get this kind of log output data. Uh, so other things like the max and the mean and min and stuff like that. Uh, are all kind of part of that. The uh, part of that. Uh, let's see. So these are like kind of input images that you can look at. Um, but one of the other cool things is you can actually look at the graph of the data itself. So or of the the uh, the model itself that you're building. So here we have a two-layer uh, network. So. If we have a two-layer network, we can actually just kind of like zoom in and look at the individual pieces of the network, like the weights and the biases and things like that for, for individual parts of the network. Uh, um, look at things like the, uh, the dropout values, the, uh, the loss function as well. So like this, this basically gives you, from the Python that code that we wrote, will give you a full kind of uh, graph representation of the, uh, of the network. So in the case of, say, something like a very complicated, you know, uh, the ImageNet thing that I was showing you earlier, you know, you would see this huge, huge graph of, uh, for, that was generated by that. Um, but this is really cool because it helps you visualize your, uh, your neural network that you, you've defined. So uh, let's go back here. I have about 10 minutes or so left or something, right? Uh, yeah, well, we'll get there. <laughs> so the, the main difference between, uh, dis between distributed training and, or di between TensorFlow and many of the other li uh, libraries that are out there is that TensorFlow was built uh, from, uh, the, uh, from day one with uh, distributed training in mind. So, Essentially, TensorFlow is built in such a way that we want to be able to productionize or to actually do practical work with our uh, with our network with our um, li with the library and with the, our networks. So we want to be able to do to train things faster, um, and based on the kind of like hardware kind of breakthroughs and improvements that we've done in the past, we've made in the past, we want to be able to utilize those to be able to train models faster. So TensorFlow uh, supports multiple different types of, uh, of parallelism, so model parallelism, 
uh, which is essentially breaking up your model. So each one of these machines uh, takes a different part of the model, uh, and you basically feed it through, uh, through here um, and basically break up the work that way. Um, it also supports what's called data parallelism, uh, which is hopefully on one of these slides. No, it disappeared. Uh, so data parallelism is the opposite, where you basically break up the data instead, but each one of the, uh, the, the machines has a full copy of the model. Uh, so you're basically splitting up, say, like record one through 100 and sending it to one machine, and you know 101 through 200 and sending it to a different machine, uh, and then uh, breaking up the, model, the values or the, the work that way. And there's a number of kind of trade-offs between these, uh, whether you use like, you do like a full graph or a subgraph type of model parallelism or synchronous or asynchronous data parallelism. Uh, this is gonna help or like, you know, there's kind of uh, these pluses and minuses to each of these. Um, so that it's kind of, there's no like silver bullet to this, uh, but, uh, I do know that at Google that we use uh, pretty much data parallels or use data parallelism pretty much exclusively. So uh, TensorFlow basically supports in a number of ways this, uh, these different types of model parallelism uh, and, uh, and um, data parallelism. So data parallelism is this one, okay. So this is where you take the data and you kind of split it up and each one of these uh, replicas has a full, uh, has the entire model. And then once you've done some training, you can pass this to the parameter server, so this is the thing that holds all the weights and the biases. So as these are updated, it'll push those back to the model replicas. And then there's like kind of asynchronous and synchronous versions uh, of data parallelism, where you're updating the model, or updating the weights and biases in parallel, or you're updating them in synchronously for each uh, you know, kind of iteration. Um, Asynchronous is, is much faster, but uh, can kind of add some, uh, some noise to your, to your model because uh, these, uh, the parameters are kind of changed midway through, uh, can be changed midway through a run, whereas uh, the, in synchronization, you kind of run the, you split up the data, and then you wait until all of the models are finished a particular epoch before you go on to the next one. Uh, so this will reduce it, but it'll actually make the, make the data a little, or make the training a little bit slower. So this is a, kind of an example of how that would run with TensorFlow, where you have a bunch of workers doing the parallelizing, and then you have some kind of parameter servers. And then in between the servers, they uh, use gRPC to, uh, to communicate. So why is this kind of data parallelism important? Um, Okay, so let's like say that instead of a cat getting a cat out of our narrow network, we got a dog, and we're like, well, we want to improve our network. We want to make that better. So uh, where do we fix? What do we fix in order to make that actually better? Uh, I don't know. Maybe this. This is probably a good idea. I don't know. So we do that. We make our tweak, and we run this again, and we're like, okay, yeah, like, this is right, nice, and it's like running on my GPU, and it's getting fine, you know, like... And then it comes out and it's like, it doesn't make it better. And you're like, oh crap, what do I, what do, I do now? Or like, you gotta go back and you gotta start over again. So in order to like run these kind of experiments, like you wanna be able to run these experiments over and over again, like very quickly. You don't wanna have to wait a week in order to figure out that your tweak went well or not. And this is, uh, this is a problem with, with people who are even experts in, in machine learning. It's like you basically, you have a, you have experience and you have literature that you can, you can use to kind of figure out, uh, you kind of narrow down what things you might uh, want to tweak. But in the end, you need to be able to run that and test to see if the data, or if the actual tweak that you made improved or doesn't, didn't improve. So you essentially have to test it. And this takes time. Uh, and so that, that's why it's very important to be able to do this kind of distributed training. But one of the problems is that as you scale up these number of nodes, like these number of connections, the number of connections between your parameter servers and between your workers uh, increases like kind of exponentially. And so this doesn't essentially scale. You essentially bottleneck on the network uh, because these, these guys are talking over TCP. Uh, and you essentially get kind of like, you know, uh, in the, on the order of milliseconds latency between the, uh, between the machines. <clears throat> 
So you essentially need to build this kind of like, you need to have like a dedicated network or a kind of dedicated hardware network. A lot of people use things like Affiniband or whatever um, in order to make this go faster. But this is actually something that's a, a really big problem at the moment. So one of the things that we did at Google is like we're releasing Cloud ML. Like internally what we do is we create we do our distributed training, but we have a, a dedicated network that doesn't use TCP IP and basically skips the whole TCP IP stacks and is able to com have the communication between the, the uh, machines run on the order of, you know, of uh, milliseconds or, or nanoseconds instead of, uh, so nanoseconds or microseconds instead of, uh, instead of milliseconds. So this is something that we are planning on making uh, public uh, as uh, what's called Cloud ML, uh, which will allow you to basically run TensorFlow graphs on uh, inside of Google data centers. We're also planning on exposing, as part of the API, the uh, um, dedicated hardware that we're using for, uh, um, so instead of GPUs, you can use what are these, these are called uh, tensor processing units, I think is what they're calling them. Uh, but essentially what they are, is they're, they're dedicated hardware used for doing tensor operations. Uh, so. So we're basically being able to like expose those, uh, but um, uh, to to other people, so that they can use use that kind of dedicated hardware in order to like kind of do more experience and things like that. Uh, so I think that's all I had. Um, so I want to thank you for coming and uh, spending you know the last hour here. Uh, how many of you are still awake? Raise your hand. <laughs> So about like 70% of you. <laughs> so, but uh, thanks a lot for coming. Uh, definitely check out the tensorflow.org uh, website. There's tons of really good examples. Like if you go here and then uh, if you go up here, there's like tutorials and documentations. This is actually really, really good uh, and has like lots of good examples about how to, uh, how to, to use TensorFlow. Um, and uh, especially if you're also a person you know, there's different ones for different levels of people, uh, as well as how to use uh, TensorFlow serving to kind of move towards actually productionizing uh, your, your models. So thanks a lot for coming, and uh, I hope you enjoyed that presentation. Yeah, two-ish questions, I think. Uh, we have like two minutes, so that works. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So your question has to be about 15 seconds, and then you know maybe 30 seconds for me to answer it. Is there anything like profiling for uh, this kind of models, like uh, to ha have an overview of how many multiplication, how many? Uh, parameters that does each block of a flow graph uh, need. So you're talking about like actual like time that it took to to run it. I don't know if if TensorBoard gives you that. I think that it probably should. If it doesn't, uh, I don't know if that offhand if that actually is. But I think that that could be something that you could visualize with TensorBoard as part of. The out, you basically log that that is a as a value that you can view here in TensorBoard, and then uh, kind of see that you know how each part of your graph performed, and sort of like things like that. Other question? Nope. Okay. Well, we got one right there behind you. So the previous talks today mentioned that you typically have to do some feature extraction before you can actually apply neural networks. Uh, will TensorFlow help me speed up my more manually designed um, feature extraction? Or is it uh, designed only to do neural network stuff? So at the moment, it's mostly geared towards neural networks. I mean, obviously, you can do like feature extraction using a separate neural network. So you could do like a neural network that does feature extraction and another one that does the actual like uh, classification and stuff. But um, there's there is some work going on. There's like uh, I forget what it's called. It's like uh, 
like TensorFlow wide or something like that, I think it's called. It uh, is essentially, instead of like having deep neural networks, it, the idea is that you have these like kind of more uh, standard type of uh, machine learning algorithms. Uh, and so I think there's, there is work going on there to like incorporate more standard machine learning algorithms. So you can do that sort of feature extraction beforehand and stuff like that. Uh, that's kind of ongoing work. You might try to search about TensorFlow wide. I haven't played with it personally, so I don't, can't really give you details. Yeah, thanks a lot.